Pastor Butts, a good round of applause. We're glad to have him. Amen. You can be seated. Praise God. Well, I really don't know where to begin after a, a lead-in like that. I almost thought for one second, who was that person anyway? <laughs> doctor. <laughs> Praise God, I know a doctor. I know a doctor. And as I was talking with this gentleman here today, this man of God today, I could feel his heartbeat. I could feel his, his, his sensing in the spirit, the need for us to reach out to those who are lost. How many here feel that today? I just want to have a raise of hand. How many feel that today? That there's a need for the lost to know Christ. I don't know about you, when I see the signs of the time and, and I watch things on TV and we work a lot in the urban community in Omaha, Nebraska. And we can see the, the mass amount of confusion, the mass amount of people that just don't seem to know where they're going at all. I was at my job not too long ago and they heard about a young man um, shooting his dad or shooting his mom over some grades and they begin to talk about it and, and they just blurt it out loud it seems like this world is getting crazier and crazier and it seems like the only way we can handle it is unless we get just as crazy that troubled me when I heard that it really troubled me I don't see getting crazier and crazier as being the answer, do you? I don't. But you know, without a security and an anchor in your life, that's about the only thing you can think. That's about the only way you can go. That's about the only thing that you can feel comfortable with is there is no control, therefore I might as well go out of control. Turn with me real quickly. I'm going to very much try to keep from preaching. They asked that I gave a message, as this pastor knows and the other pastor knows, when God calls you to preach, sometimes it's a hard thing not to do. But today I'm going to give you a testimony because I believe it's in need at this meeting today. I believe that it's in need and what the heartbeat of God is saying today is to go into the world, preach the gospel. And then those who hear the gospel, they are going to be saved. But what is the gospel they're going to hear? What is the good news? There are some people that we know out there, the good news is not going to be you telling them Jesus loves you. The good news is going to be that I used to be where you used to be. I know what you're going through. I was there before. But see, I know someone. I know somebody that I can tell you about that in turn can change your life. You don't have to always be that way. Turn to Psalm 68 and I'm going to read 68, 3 and 5. If we have a heading for this or if you want to remember this time or this day, I'm just going to call this a father of the fatherless. A father of the fatherless. Psalm 68 and 3 starts with this. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name at Jeha. And rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless, a judge of the widow, is God in his holy habitation. Is God in his holy habitation. That is my standard that is my foundation I stand on on how you see me here today I can sing I can rejoice I can be glad as we were doing that in praise and worship I can do that because that last verse of that promise that he's a father to the fatherless is something that I can claim for myself even as you see me here now in my nice suit the one that my wife picked by the way my hair looking nice, the, one, the, the, the putting together that my wife has did. My nice family that you see here. 
There was once upon a nine brothers and sisters in Christ, and those who don't and may not be that way, I was not what you see today. I was not as maybe as eloquent as a speaker as you hear me today. Even as I was talking with Brother Crone, sometimes, and I have to admit myself, we kind of forget where we came from. We kind of forget where we came from. I wasn't always as well as I seen. My life wasn't always as transformed as I am today. It was not. We live in a society today that I lived in once. We know that there are many, many family members who are living basically with one parent at home. They're called single parent mothers or sometimes even fathers. They grow up all their life not having a mother or a father around. I grew up in that generation. I grew up in that type of family. I did not have a father around since I was about three years old. It was a dysfunctional family. My father was an alcoholic. He was physically and mentally abusive to his family and to his wife. I remember one time my mom told me of a story when he came home real drunk out of the many times that he's did many a times and he was upset because of the fact that he she wanted to go to church that night she was a very devout Catholic praise God for Catholics and he did not want her to go in this case out that night he had the feeling as he did being twisted and warped from the drugs, I mean from the alcohol in his family background, that she was an item that he owned. And to him, it was a competition of my love, your love for me, or this God thing. And so he grabbed her by the back of her neck and pointed a gun to her head and said, tonight, if you want to live past this day, you're going to have to deny God. Because it's between me and God tonight. And I'm going to be first. I'm going to be first. My, how my mother must have felt. I did not see that. The family did not see that. I was told about this later on. My, how she must have felt knowing that her life was on the line. She may not have woke up the next day. She could have died on the spot. But she told me that at that particular time, she felt a peace that she couldn't explain. She said she felt a, a courage that never has been felt before. That even in the faith, face of death, she had a confidence that was beyond understanding. And she looked in my father's face and said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. My father, frustrated as can be, even through his alcoholic stupor he was frustra frustrated as could be I can imagine he probably was scared that even in the face of death that someone would say I would not deny God and he walked away and of course my mom lives today my mom she was a very quick tempered woman Ideal idealistic she had the idea that when she got married she was going to live forever with him some of us women out there know about the, 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 the knight in the shining armor. And that's the kind of idea she grew up with. Was from her family. Her family was from another northern family. My father was from a southern family. She would get angered sometimes because of her temper. And I remember many times she would beat us just because of her anger, mercifully. Sometimes I'd get beat so bad I wouldn't even feel the pain anymore. I remember having glass thrown at me and had to go to the hospital because of the fact I had to be stitched up. She was frustrated, angered because of her situation. As I began to grow up angered and upset because of my family situation, about three or four years old, my mom and dad, and I say this because I like to use this word, fell from grace. They separated in so many words. Do you know that God puts in every young man's heart, even like my son here, the need to have a role model of a father? He puts that in them. I had that in me, but there was no physical father around. 
And if there's no physical father around, he's going to try to find one. I did. So I began to look towards the streets. And I ran into many dangerous people and dangerous fellas because I was looking for that comfort, that peace, that covering that comes from a father that was not at my home. One of the earliest memories that I have as I grew up that I remember today, I think it was a toddler and I was in bed and I remember that my mother and father came into the room. It's amazing how, now that I'm talking about it now, it's amazing how mothers and fathers who are out here that what you do can have everlasting effects on your children. Everlasting effects. It can be in the back of their mind and they can remember it later on years past and you don't even know that. I remember when I was a toddler, they both came in arguing. I don't know what they were arguing, but I just know that it, you, I just knew it wasn't a good conversation. And they were kind of like silhouettes. And I remember as I looked over at mom, it's amazing how too that um, in situations of arguments or troubles, usually the dad gets the blame, by the way. <laughs> you can laugh over that. Moms don't get much blame, but dads do. <laughs> but I remember when I was young, at least what I remembered in my mind was, what is dad doing to mom? What is dad doing to mom? And I remember looking at mom and, and, and I saw something shiny in her hand. And lo and behold, she had a knife in her hand. And she was just, just with her hand, she was going like this, going like this to my dad, trying to keep him off. As a young little toddler in my bed, uh, I didn't know what to do. I was very, very scared. It frightened me. It was a memory that tormented me. And it came back later on in years. As I began to grow up into my preteen years, I began to, at least the whole family, as we began to go out into our neighborhood. We kind of lived in a multi-culture neighborhood. We had blacks, we had whites, we had Puerto Ricans. And I remember as I began to go out to our neighborhood, we began to know the friends in the neighborhood, kids. They used to make fun of us because we had no father around. Used to call us names like Sissy. I don't know if they use that word anymore, do they? I don't know. Any young kids? Well, I don't know. Used to call us Sissy. Used to call us Mama's Boy used to call us other names that I wouldn't even want to mention. But what used to hurt me the most was our cousins down the street. That whenever we didn't do what they liked, they would wait till all of us got together in a group, that all of our kids, and then they would stand out of the crowd and say, yeah, you ain't got no father. And then they'd call us names. It used to hurt me. It bothered me. I don't know how much it really bothered my other family, though I know that it did, but it bothered me a lot. There are many angry kids today that are lost out there who are angry because of the fact that there's somebody that made fun of them. Someone put them down. Someone called them names and they haven't forgot it. And they didn't turn away and kind of wash it away. They turned away in anger. I did. Through that I began to get angry at the world. I got angry at people. I got angry at myself. I got angry at everybody around me. Even our relatives weren't always as relatives should be. You see, back then when women were single, it wasn't, let's say, too kosher, if I can use the word. Because on my mom's side, we had, by the way, doctors and lawyers on my mom's side. On my dad's side, they're originally from down south. So the blue collar workers, they moved up here from down south from farming land to work in the packing plants. So we had like the north and the south together in a family. But it wasn't too kosher to have a single woman known in the family on both sides. My dad came from a 13 member family, all boys and one girl. He was the baby of the family. My mom, because of the fact that she was the daughter and she was the only one that in this particular case was not doing financially well, at least in their eyes she was not, especially being single. They were ashamed of her, didn't come by and visit her, left her in a very, very 
very poor neighborhood and a poor home. The relatives on my dad's side blamed my mom for the separation. Never came by, never visited. I began to hate my relatives. I hated them. On Easter's and Christmas and the nice days when the cars down the block had their relatives coming over to visit. Those happy occasions, maybe some of us out here may know. No one came to visit us. No one came to see us. I began to wonder what, what was wrong with us. Were we not right? Were we not human beings? I hated myself. I was ashamed of my family. I hated my relatives. But you know, I then began to hate God. I then began to hate God. There were many times I would see my mom alone and she would pick up the Bible and read it. I remember at, at dinner table, she'd have each one of us read the Bible. And I remember I would say to myself, why am I reading this Bible? What good is it doing us? Some days we would have, because back then, because she couldn't find a job and my dad was separate or did not live with her, we were on welfare. Back then sometimes the, 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 the food wouldn't always last for the week. And sometimes I remember eating bread with milk. And when it really got bad, sometimes it was water with bread. <laughs> and we ate that. We ate that. Can you imagine how I thought, I'm going to tell you, I felt like what is this God stuff when the Bible was passed around to me what is this is this some type of of crutch people have just to make them feel good when in the reality of this world ain't nothing going on that's what I felt but for mom I would read it there's something about moms bless their hearts for mom I would read it but inside inside I would say I hate this God I hate him. I hate him. He's the one that caused me not to have a father. He's the one that caused me to have no one I could talk to, no one who could understand me. I hated him. Every time the Bible passed around, I would hate him even that much more. I remember times I would look out from our porch and down the street our cousins, the very cousins that made fun of us, the dad would come out and walk their sons just to walk out and talk. You know, some of us do that with our sons now. I do that with mine. They just would be walking with their son down the street, just talking. And I would watch them as they walked out. And inside, I was dying, just wishing I could have a father, someone I could talk to, someone I could share the way I felt, somebody on this earth that was like another man that I could share with. But I had nobody. I had nobody at all. And when I would see them inside, I would say, where is that father for me? I'm a fatherless. Where is that father for me? I hated the world. I hated my relatives. I was ashamed of my family. And I especially hated God. As I began to grow up and got into my teen years, I remember I started to look at hardcore pornography magazines. You see, if you don't have a role model to help you out, then you could almost go any direction. And I did. You used to pick up those pornography magazines. You used to look at them. Oh, it was nice, first of all, because you saw the funny pictures. But pretty soon, the pictures began to be more than just pictures. Pretty soon, because of being a young man, there was desires. There were some of those physical attractions that come along with young men that those books begin to cater to. But I had no father to tell me to make the discernment between right and wrong. I had nobody to talk to. My mom didn't know what to say, what to do. At that particular time, I was so much of an angry, young, rebellious person, I suppose I'd been scared if I was around myself. One of the bad things about it is my younger brothers, I had one, they looked for somebody they didn't have a father, so what did they do? They looked to the older brother. I wasn't a good example. So I began to turn him on to pornography magazines. And we both used to look at them together. I would say today that's probably why he has a lot of trouble. In fact, I know that's why he has a lot of trouble in his life today. 
because of that. As time went on, and I grew up in my teenage years, still hating myself, still hating my relatives, ashamed of my mom, but especially hating God. But deep down inside, I was still saying to myself, I need a father. I need someone I could talk to. Someone who could understand me. Someone who could say that it's all right. It's all right. Anyway, I remember when I got into my teen years, I started to hang out with dangerous people. When I mean dangerous people, I'm talking about dangerous people. Des Moines is not a big town, by the way. It's only about two, well, how many people in Des Moines? About 250, 350,000, something like that. It's not a big town. Well, anyway, some young, well, some older people move into the neighborhood. Our older adults, our younger adults move into the neighborhood. Four, one was 16 and one was uh, 22. They moved into our neighborhood and began to hang out with us guys. Well, lo and behold, both of them came from Chicago, the south side of Chicago. I became attracted to them. Remember, I didn't have a father, but inside of me and every young man, because God puts in you the longing for that role model of a father. I attached myself to them. I became friends with them. And because, because being friends with them, if anybody knows anything about the Chicago, especially the south side of Chicago, it's not the best side of town to be on. It's not the best side of town to really learn from. But people live there. Young people live there. And so I began to learn some of the stuff they were doing. They began to go out and drink. Begin to go out and smoke. Begin to go out and do a lot of partying, picking up girls. The word they call it, if you were young and in turn were doing things like on the street, they call it hustling. I learned how to hustle. I learned how to be deceitful. I learned how to lie. I learned how to do anything that I could to do what I wanted to do. By then, I hated myself. I hated my relatives. I hated my family now. I hated everybody. And I especially hated God. By then my heart was so hardened at that time, I didn't care about anybody or anything. That type of lifestyle fitted just right for me. You know people in that lifestyle who really hate themselves. They really don't care about themselves. That's why they don't care about the world. I didn't. I didn't at all. I remember at 14, 15 years old, I would come home sometimes 2 or 3 in the morning. I was 14 coming home 2 or 3 in the morning. I know it must have hurt my mom. I know it must have did. I didn't care. I blamed her for my dad leaving. I remember on my 14th birthday. On a 14th birthday, wouldn't you think a 14 years old, shouldn't he enjoy himself on his 14th birthday? Shouldn't he have a nice, clean party or at least a fellowship with his own family? I didn't. On my 14th birthday, my friends from Chicago, they said, come live it up. There's no tomorrow. Enjoy what you can today. So we went out partying all night, and I drank a whole fifth of vodka to myself at 14 years old. I came home about 1 o'clock, drunk as can be. You see, back then, one of the things that was impressive for young people is to be able to fool and deceive people. It's called rebellion. And so one of the coolest things to be able to do was to be able to fool your mom or your dad. In this case, it was my mom. So I sat with my mom for a whole hour. I remember watching the late night show, Johnny Carson, drunk as can be. I thought to myself, my mom didn't know. But you know what I look at today? And I look in her eyes. I knew she knew. I knew she knew. But she couldn't do anything about it. She could see that hate. She could see that anger inside. All she could do was love me. I went upstairs, and I remember I threw up all that, all that night. Woke up in the morning, and Mom said, "Hey, what's wrong? What happened to you?" You know, what I told her. I told her it was her food I ate that night. <laughs> I told her it was her food that made me sick, and that's why I threw up. I hated myself. I hated my family. I hated everybody, black and white, and I especially hated God. But inside, 
I wanted someone to understand me. Someone I could talk to. I was looking for my father. I was looking for him. At 14 years old, I remember I had a full beard just like this when I was 14 years old. I did. I remember in high school paper they, they wrote, Craig thinks he's a grown man now because now he has dirt on his face. That's what they wrote in the high school paper. But at 14 years old, because of the fact that I had a full beard, I was looked upon and could be fooled as being an adult. So at 14 years old, because I would hang out with people who was much older than me, we decided to go to a triple X rated movie. At 14 years old, I watched a triple X rated movie. No one said anything when I walked in. And the first movie that I watched was a movie called Deep Throw. What would a 14-year-old boy do in, in a triple X movie, watching a show like that? I was there. I walked out, sick as can be, too. Because in the inside, I was still a boy looking for a father. At 14, I began to smoke cigarettes. Started off with camels. Didn't stay at camels, they were just a little too strong for me. Moved on to a cigarette called Cool. Well, where I came from, things were always nice when they're called Cool. So Cools kind of went right along with my lifestyle. I was introduced to dope when I was 14. It was pot. That is the gateway drug. They say that today, and it is. It is a gateway drug. It's a door that opens up many other drugs. I was introduced, of all things, to pot by my very cousins. That would many times make fun of me and us because we didn't have a father. As time began to go on, and I began to go into my teenage years in 15 and 16 and started in high school, I went to a high school that was called Tech High School, where they had people all over Des Moines that went to the Tech High School. There were people from so many different backgrounds. It was a good time for me because I ran into a lot of other young men who were like me. Men at the world, hated themselves, hated their families, and they hated God. But we got along together. I began to push dope when I was in high school. I sold acid. I sold, uh, I'm trying to remember some of this stuff too, it's been such a while. Uppers, downers. Whatever you can think of, I sold. I pushed it to the ninth graders, I pushed it to the twelfth graders. I pushed it to the adults, whoever wanted to buy it. I pushed it. I didn't care. I didn't care. I hated myself. I hated my family. And I hated people. And I especially hated God. Because I didn't have a father. Didn't have a father around. I remember times when we would go out at night and I would get so high just to lose the reality on the touch of my life and the pain that I had inside. I would get so high, some people call it blitz or whatever, that, that I would lose track of days. There was one time that, that I was so high after this particular party, I didn't really even know who I was. I couldn't feel my body. I could barely stand up. And I remember while I was walking down the street, just in the days, I could just feel a little bit of my consciousness of myself. And I remember I cried out to God. I said, God, if you help me to go, if you help me get someplace safe, I at least would do something for you. And the next thing I remember, I woke up in my brother's home. Now what's significant about that is that my brother's home was at least four or five miles away from where I was at. And I could barely walk a couple of steps. You know when I look back today, I know it was nothing but the angel of God that probably grabbed me and walked me home. 
and took me to the right place. I could have went any place. I didn't know. Someone could have took me anywhere and I could not have resisted. But God took me home. He took me home. I still hated God. No, I didn't turn to God. No, I didn't say, well, I'm going to go to God now because I'm home. No, I didn't. This is amazing sometimes when we're in real emergency situations, we'll call upon God. And then sometimes we forget all about it once it's all over with. I did. I did. At 15 years old, I was also an alcoholic. I would drink so much, I would black out for two or three days. And I have to go back and ask people what I did. That's 15 years old. That's how much I drunk. I wanted to get away from this pain inside. I wanted to get away from the fact that it seemed like no one loved me. I wanted to get away from the fact that when I came back home, there was no father there. There was no one that understood me. There was no one that seemed to care about me. There would be nights that I would walk alone. Because of the fact that many nights, I couldn't get in the house. He just wouldn't open the door. And I would walk alone. I remember I would look up to the, the sky, look up to the stars, and I would curse God. I would curse Him. Because I hated Him. And every time I would curse Him, every time I would tell Him I would never want to serve Him. Because I'm a nobody, I'm nothing. Who cares about me? And I don't care about anyone else. I never did tell God. Oh, I never did get a feeling back of, I don't care about you. I never did get a feeling back of, so what? I never did get a feeling back of nothing at all. I've always got back this feeling of, you're all right. You're somebody special. I care about you. I always got that back when I would shout to the sky. Always. Remember, I hated everybody. I hated everything. Some nights I wouldn't come home at all. Sometimes I would stay over houses that were full of drug addicts. Just a whole bunch of men that were pushing drugs or either on drugs. They would have one or two women around. It was a horrible scene to be in. It was a horrible scene to be in. I think the only reason why we could stay in that is because none of us didn't care about anyone else. We didn't care about ourselves either. We were so desensitized to anything that was caring, it really didn't matter to us. It certainly didn't matter to the one or two women who were there. It certainly didn't. I was 15 years old. 15 years old. What is a young man, 15 years old, doing in a place like that? Or her being in any place like that? If, it's, if inside he doesn't care. If inside he hates the world. If inside he's so hardened in his heart that it doesn't matter what he does and what he thinks. I was that way. My first sexual encounter, instead of it being a lovely one as God would want it to be, with a wife. If it's a woman, it would be with a husband. Instead of my first one being that way, because I didn't care about the world, didn't care about anyone, it didn't matter to me. It was just purely whatever could satisfy what I wanted. My first sexual encounter was with a prostitute. And that was only because of the fact that, in this case, she was doing it to show it off to her other girls, that she had a young virgin boy. That's what I was. On the outside, if you would have saw me, you would have ran from me. You would have ran from me. Because if you didn't, I would make you run from me. Because I didn't want anyone near me. I didn't want you to love me. I didn't want you to care for me. Because I hated myself. I hated my family. I hated everybody and I hated God. I hated God. So it didn't matter to me at all. So it was just a good game for her. She thought she was dealing with a man, but I was just a boy inside looking for a father. That's all. Just a boy inside looking for a father. I remember one night when I came home to my mom's house, I think it was about 2 or 3 in the morning. 
And I knocked at the door. I said, Mom, let me in. Let me in. Please let me in. She wouldn't let me in. Mothers, if you know of any young men or young boy that are having troubles, sometimes it's good to say no. Sometimes it's good to say no. Oh, I know the world says you say, should say yes to your kids all the time. I'm telling you, sometimes it's good to say no. They need to have guidelines. They need to have boundaries. I didn't have any. I didn't have any. She wouldn't open the door. So I ran and got on the phone and talked to one of those shelters. There are many shelters all across the country that you call one in this particular case when you need some place to stay. I called and talked to the shelter and the shelter in turn was saying to me, well, what do you need, young man? What's your problem? And I began to just hem and haw. I was too prideful to even want to tell them I needed help. I didn't want anyone to get close to me. I didn't want anyone to love me. So they finally said to me the last time, why are you calling? And I hung up the phone. Now I remembered my dad's phone number. And by the way, I did not call my dad, dad. I did not call him that. I called him by his first name, which was Lewis. Whenever we would go, or once in a while I would go over to the relatives to visit them, or he would see me out, I would just call him Lewis. I know he hated it, but I didn't care. I didn't care. I'd call him Lewis in front of the relatives, from his mom and dad, or in front of anyone. Because to me, he was not a father. To me, he wasn't my father. So I called him that night. I asked him, would you keep me? I need, to, I need, to, I need some place to stay. Inside again. Because I had no place to stay. I would say, just maybe, just maybe her be a father. Just maybe this time her do something right. I called him up. And he said, well, son, that's what he said. He said, well, I'd like to, but you know, I, I've got a girlfriend over tonight. And, you know, it's best to call before you come. So, maybe a next time. I hung up the phone immediately. And I walked, I remember, all that night with tears in my eyes. And I don't know where I walked, but I know I walked all that night and I was mad as can be. And again, I looked up in the sky and I cursed God. I cursed Him. I said, I'll never serve you. I'll never love you. And it seemed like the more I cursed Him, the more I cussed Him, the more I wished I was dead. It seemed like the more I could hear God say, hear somebody special. I ran away from home when I was 16. I had enough with the family situation. I had enough with playing the son when I came home. I figured if I'm going to hate the world and hate God, I'm just going to go all the way. I'm not going to anymore cause my mother any more heartaches and trouble. It just, I just felt it just just didn't need to be that way anymore so I begin to hang out in crowds even much more I begin to get even more hateful and more violent every time I drink I would become a very violent violent person my friends stopped wanting to be around me because of the fact I was so violent we one time came out of a club and I wanted to go some other place. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I wanted to go some other place. It was his car. And, and I was with him and I just basically told him, no, we're going over this place. And he said, no, we're not, no, not going to do that. I said, no, we're going over here. He said, no. And so I began to curse at him. I began to, to physically get violent with him. And I remember when I looked down at the, in, in the back of the car, I looked down for some reason, I, I got back up and all of a sudden I saw a gun pointing at my head. You know, you hear people say that when uh, you get guns pointing in front of your head, your life passes in front of you. Well, I want to give you a test of when it does happen. It does happen. My life just begin to flash right in front of me. And the alcohol I had in me, it seemed like that drunkness began to drop to a level of almost nothing. 
and I remember why that gun was sticking in the, in front of my face and the barrel looked like it was that big. I remember in the inside of me something began to say, you need to say something to God. Again, it's an amazing when we get in emergency situations, life or death situations, we call upon God. I was the person that hated God and hated everyone, but I called on Him. I said, God, if you get me out of this one, if you only get me out of this one, as I said before, I said, I'd, I'd, do, I'd do something for you. The gentleman put the gun down, told me to back out of the car, so I backed out of the car. But instead of me walking away from the situation because of the hate I had inside. Do you know hate would in turn birth pride? Many people who are hateful have a lot of pride in them. I'll let you know that. Many people who are hateful have a lot of pride in them. I was so prideful that I went over to a buddy of mine and said, someone just pointed a gun at me. I'm going to shoot and kill him. He's got no right to point no gun at me. Who does he think he is? My friend of mine opened up his trunk and he had a double barrel shotgun in it. And I was planning to use it to shoot him. 15 years old, hated the world, hated everybody. Hated God. Thank God that night he didn't have any shotgun shells. He used the rifle basically as a deterrent. So the night went on and I lived on. The family decided after long reasoning, I think it was on my mom's side, we need to do something about that young man. You see, I was the only one in that generation on my mom's side that ever was doing what he was doing. I probably had their grandfather's grandfathers turning in bed or in the grave in this particular case. So they decided to put some money together and send me to Florida. Did you know that if the inside of you was not changed or transformed, you take it wherever you go? I'll say that again. Did you know that if the inside of you was not changed, you take it wherever you go? They didn't know that. They figured they send their young grandchild, in this case my mom's being her son, to Florida. Just maybe the fun in the sun, notice I said the fun, not the sun, but the fun in the sun would somehow do some type of change, would get him right. I went down there to visit with my grandparents to stay with them, bless their hearts. Very, very good people. My grandfather is dead today, but my grandmother is 85 years old and I love her dearly. She did her best to love me unconditionally. She tried her best, but she did not know I hated her also too. I especially hated my grandfather. She did not know that. So I hung around with a young man that was 20 some years old and we would go out to the pier. We would go shark fishing. I don't know if anyone's ever been shark fishing before, but we went shark fishing on a little 12 foot boat. And I used to get scared because coming from Des Moines, Iowa, it was kind of scary going up on the Gulf of Mexico, hitting waves about 10 to 12 feet. It looked like we were going to drown. But I got kind of used to it. I kind of liked the lifestyle. And he was into his own lifestyle. He loved to go out to topless bars. And so that's why I went. 16 years old, I was going out with someone 21 years old. And we would hit the topless bars. Down in, down south, they have, of course it's changed, uh, hopefully a lot today. They had a lot of segregation going on down south. Even back in this, I think it was, yeah, 70s. The 70s, the late 70s. And so they had two topless bars. They had a black topless bar and a white topless bar. Well, since my friend of mine was white, I hung out in a white topless bar. I don't think that was too kosher, but I did anyway. Remember, I didn't care about myself. I didn't care about the world, and I especially didn't care about God. So I hung out there with him. And to make a long story short, I ended up having an affair, or not affair, but a sexual encounter with a young lady in the bar. I found out later on, she happened to be the girlfriend of a leader of a motorcycle gang. The guy was about seven foot something and weighed 300 some pounds. Thank God, 
At that time, my grandparents decided to send me back. They had enough with me, so they sent me back. I came back even more rebellious and angered than it had been before. I still longed for someone to talk to. I couldn't talk to my grandfather. I couldn't talk to my mom and dad. I couldn't talk to anybody. And I came back even angered than it was before. As I went on, I was about 16 or 17 in high school before I graduated. In fact, I graduated early because of the fact that I was 18 years old when I started into 12th grade. I was old enough at 18 to write my own notes. Did you know that's what I did in high school? I wrote my own notes. When I didn't feel like going to school, I wrote the notes and gave it to the principal. He couldn't do a thing about it. He couldn't do a thing about it. And I'd just leave school. I did graduate. I graduated with average scores. I could have graduated better, but I didn't care. The only reason why I stayed in school was because there was a teacher that saw potential in me. And she basically basically babied me all through high school. If it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't. In fact, I know I would never graduate. There was no reason for me to. No reason for me. My last year in high school, I was going with a lady. Yes, she was a lady. I was 18 years old. She was 28 years old. She had three kids. Three girls, and all of them called me dad. We lived in a house and had a car. In my mind, there was no reason for me to continue on. I was finally supposed to be where it was all, was all about. Round circles, coming back around again. A father. We used to call it playing house. I finally got hooked up with a recruiter. Bless the recruiter's hearts. Back then, boy, they were some recruiters. I don't know if any military people were in here. If, if they are, excuse me, I was in the military too myself. This recruiter just knew all the good tricks. He bought me all the cigarettes I needed. He took me to all the parties. So I decided to go to the military. You see, I went to the military not because I needed to go. I went to the military because I wanted to escape my situation. I wanted again to run away. But do you know, if there's no change in the inside, wherever you go, you're going to take yourself with you. So I took myself into the military. And in the military, that hateful, rebellious person who hated himself, who hated his family, who hated everybody, who hated God, was there in the military. And I ended up hating the military. I hated authority. I hated authority that was attached to any man. Any man. I hated it. Because they reminded me of the father that I didn't have. It ended up where the military couldn't stand me, so they booted me out. And while I was in the military, you know, I was so bold, I was so hateful, I was selling drugs in the military. I was selling to people in the squadron. I was selling to people outside of the squadron. I remember one night when we were smoking, I don't know what it was, this Puerto Rican gentleman. He was a friend of mine. We both were talking together. And he stopped and he said, you know, in, in, in where I'm from, in, 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 in some place in New York, he said, you know what we do to people that we feel are, 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 are what they call uh, squealers, I think that's what they call people that will, you know, tell that you're smoking dope or into drugs on the police. He said, you know what we do to them? He said, no. I said, why do you say that anyway? He said, I thought you were a, 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 a narc. That's the better word. Thank you, Lord. I thought you were a narc. He looked at me. He said, if I would have found out that you were a narc, you know what I would have did to you? He said, I said, what? He pulled out this long switchblade. He said, I would have cut your throat. You know, when I look upon that today, God was in that. I could have been killed again. That's the third time I could have been killed. What would have stopped him from killing me? There was no one that would have told him that I was not a narc or not. I wasn't, but how would he have known? I could have been killed. So they booted me out of the military. I came back frustrated. I came back an alcoholic. I came back staying with my mom. Back to mom again. I stayed with her. And every morning my mom would try to wake me up and I could not and would not wake up. I didn't want to face the world. 
I didn't want to face the world. I couldn't face the world. Being an alcoholic, I could not face the world. I had to have something to drink if I was going to face the world. I had to have something to drink if I was going to face the world. I hated myself. I hated my family. I hated the world. I really wanted to die, but I wouldn't kill myself. It finally came down to, my, uh, down to the point again, my mom said, you got to go. And my mom finally, somehow in some way, got me out of the house. And so on my own, I lived in an apartment, a small little apartment down in the basement. And I began to migrate back into the same stuff I was into. I began to get back on the street and, and do a little bit of a hustling, back into that lifestyle again. And then all of a sudden, I ran into a relative of mine. This relative happened to be married to a lady who at that particular time I knew way back in eighth grade that I was going with. Well, see, I didn't know they were going through marriage problems. And at that particular time, I was getting friendly back again, not with her, but back with the brother. One night I was over the brother's house and we were just sitting around talking. And all of a sudden a car pulled up. Long car. I mean, it was a Fleetwood or something like that. And it pulled up and, and they shot it from, out from the car. Craig, come out here. I want to talk to you. I was like, well, I don't know what's going on. At that time I was drunk or high. I can't remember. I didn't care about anything anyway. I mean, who's someone's going to call me? He didn't have an appointment, whatever you want to call it. So anyway, he called me again, come outside. And so I decided to come outside to see who it was. And then I looked in the car and it was my cousin. He said, I want to talk to you. I said, oh, I don't want to talk to you. And so, you know, not that my cousin didn't do anything. I just was doing something else. And so I walked back into the house. And while I was walking back to the cousin's house, all of a sudden, I heard, I heard the, 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 how can I say it? The cock of a pistol being cocked. And I turned around, and he had a, a 45 pointing towards my back. And he said, get in the car. Well, I got in the car. I sat in the car right beside him, and he was sitting right over here. And as they pulled off, and the two guys in the front, inside, I had this voice saying, you're not coming back again. This is it. You're not coming back. You're going to die. And I begin to get scared in the inside. I didn't show that to him, but I begin to get scared in the inside. And he began to tell me about how much he thought I was messing with his girlfriend, or his wife, excuse me, and how much he said, you're coming in between us. Now remember, this wife of his, I went with her way back in eighth grade. And I was going to become the fall or the scapegoat for him. And as he had the pistol, I remember it was shining in the back of a car and, and two friends were pulling off as we were driving around the block. I remember as I heard that voice shout, yet you're not coming back, you're going to die. I remember again in the inside I said, God, where are you? I need you. It's been about the third time or fourth time. I said, God, if you get me out of this one, I certainly would do right with you. Get me out of this one. You know, people who don't know God and people that do know God, first with people that don't know God, if you're sincere and if you really mean it, God will heal you. God spoke through me some things that I didn't know where it was coming from. In fact, the very two gentlemen who were in the front of the car, they begin to shake their head and say, you know, he's right about that. You know he's right about that. No, we, we ought to listen to him. The intention of this cousin of mine to kill me changed around. He was so convicted by what I said that he put the gun down between both of us. But you know, isn't it amazing that if there's really not a change in the inside, even though you're sincere, there's still another person on the other side, which we know is being the devil that doesn't care about you. Inside my head something shouted, the same voice that said you were going to die, shouted and said, this is your time, you better pick that gun up now and shoot him now, otherwise he's going to shoot you. And I looked at the gun and I wanted to reach out and grab it and shoot him. I wanted to, but inside there was a voice that said, it's going to be alright. It's going to be alright. You're somebody special. You don't have to do that. And so I sat there quietly with my hands like this. 
We drove back to where we came from, this very same house where she lived. And he let me go. He let me go. I look back at that day, and I believe the angels of God were there and were protecting me, even through my foolishness. I didn't turn to God. I didn't all of a sudden walk into a church, but in the inside, deep down in the inside, that hardening of my heart, that hatred I had to God, this was the third time in my heart was saying, You see, by that third time, my, my, my whole self was saying, I'm not going to get away with this next time. There's something out here that wants me dead. It wants me dead. And every time I'm almost in a situation to be killed, this God I keep calling upon gets me out of it every time. There's got to be something real about Him. There's got to be something real about Him. There's got to be something real about him. And I remember on that day, it was a rock bottom day for me. I was tired of my lifestyle. I was tired of the dope. I was tired of the alcohol. I was tired of going out with two or three women every night, not feeling one thing at all in the morning. I was tired of being tired. I was tired of hating people. I was tired of hating myself. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I remember I finally looked up to God and this time I didn't cuss at him. This time I didn't shake my fist at him. This time I said to him, God, if you are real, if you are that God, I remember my mom many a times reading that Bible at home by herself when no relatives loved her. There was no dad that was there. I couldn't understand how she read that Bible, that Bible that passed around the table. I said, if you are real, I said, I need you now than I've ever did before. I'm tired. I feel like I've lived three or four lives and I don't think I'm going to live anymore. And then I said to him, I said, and I know it was nothing but my heart that was saying that for years and years and years. I said, God, I need a father. I need a father. I, I want a family. I want a wife. I want to be that father I never had. That's what I really want. That's what I'm looking for. If you could do this for me, if you could make this happen for me, I would give you my life. I would give you my life. I would give you my life. And here I stand. Here I stand. With the woman. With the family. My prayers were answered. The promises of God are true. His word, it will not come back void. He is, as he had said in Psalms, as we read on the last one, 16 and 5, our Father God, he is a father to the fatherless. He is a father to the fatherless. And I can say to you today, he is my father. I can call him Abba Father. I can call him that. I had no earthly father. I had no one as an example. But I can tell you today, I know someone that I can call as being my Abba Father. I know someone. Would you close your eyes, please? Father, I've called on you many a times, and you have heard my prayers many a times, Father. I thank you, Father, you, you have said that I was special, not because, Father, that I was better than anyone, but because, Father, I needed to know that I was somebody. Because everything in my world was saying, you're nobody, you're nothing.
You're not special. I thank you, Father. I was special to you. I thank you for the Father. Because, Father, I know when Jesus was on the cross 2,000 years ago and he looked up and said it was finished, I saw, Father, he could see me through eons on time. He looked into the future and he saw me when I was born. He knew what I was going to go through. He knew what I was not going to have. And he said, I'm going to die for him. I'm going to die for him. I'm going to die for him. I ask that today, Father, if there's somebody in this place that doesn't know, who can't call God as being his father, who can't say, God is my father today, that today, if he hears the voice, if he hears your voice, he can call you his father. He's got a right to call you his father. Jesus said, no man can come unto the father but by me. Today, if he accepts Jesus as being his Lord, he can call him his Father. And I ask, Father, that there may be some young men or some men out here or maybe some women who have had earthly fathers. But, Father, even as I spoke with a minister one time when we talked about this coming back from a meeting, and he said, I had a father that lived with me. He, he really guided me, but I miss him so much because he's dead. I miss his guidance. I miss, I miss him. And I looked around and I could feel his pain. I told him, I have never had an earthly father. But I can tell you today, I can introduce you to a father that will never leave you or forsake you now until the end of time. For he's a father of the fatherless. And he's a father of us all. Today, Father, if there are and there is someone in here today that's missing their father, or maybe they haven't had a good understanding with their father, I ask that today, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you touch them, Father. Let this message pierce their hearts and their mind today. That they can know your love. They can know your peace. They can know you as being a father today. I ask that you do that, even right now. I'm going to ask why your eyes are closed. If there was someone in here today that was touched by that message, if there was someone here today that they felt the tug of God's Spirit inside, I'm going to just ask you to do one thing. I'm going to ask you to get up at all. I'm going to ask you to move from your place. I want you just to raise your hands on a sign of submission that this was a message that's touching you. Just raise your hand real quickly. Would you do that? There's one. There's two. Keep raising. Keep them raised. Would you? Would you keep them raised? There's two to raise their hand. Is there anyone else? Maybe you know somebody that's going through that. Maybe you know a young man or a young woman that's going through the same thing. And you want to stand or, or, or as you're there in proxy for them. Don't you know that earthly fathers represent here on earth a father in heaven? And if they don't have a good relationship with you or them, they're going to be even as I was. Even as I was. Those that raised their hands as they did, I, I, I want you, as you have, have raised your hand, I want you, as I pray this prayer, I want you just to repeat it to yourself. And I want all those who haven't raised their hand just to pray along with me. Would you do that? And I want you just to pray it out loud. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, today is the day that I've heard your voice. And today, Father, I can call you Father. You're not just a Lord to me. You're not just a king to me. You're not just my ruler. But you're my friend. I can know you intimately. I can share every one of my thoughts with you. I can share every one of my imaginations with you. For you are my Father. Help me today, Father, to sit at your feet, to sit at your throne, to let you put your arms around me, to feel your peace to feel your strength, to gain that confidence that comes from off in glory. Even as Jesus knew 
when he was here on earth. For he said he did nothing but what the Father showed him and told him. So today, Father, I do nothing that is different from you. I say everything you say. I do everything you do. I imitate everything that you are. For you are my father. And I am your child. And as being a child, I imitate my parent. And today, Father, I will do as you did. I will go into the world and share the gospel and speak the gospel. I'll be a father to the fatherless. I'll be a parent to the orphans. I'll give, I'll give food to those who are hungry. I'll give clothing to those who are naked. I will give counseling to those who need to be delivered. I will be, Father, even as you are, so shall I be. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Praise God. Honey, would you come and say? God, just have us way tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I just want to be where you are. In your dwelling place forever. Take me to the place where you are. I just want to be with you. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Seating at your table. Surrounded by your glory. In your presence, that's where I always want to be. I just want to be, I just want to be with you. I just want to be where you are, in your dwelling place. Forever, take me to the place where you are. I just want to be with you. I want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence, feasting at your table. Surrounded by your glory in your presence, that's where I always want to be. I just want to be, I just want to be with you. Everyone that wants to be with God tonight, I want you to sing that verse with me right now. I just want to be where you are, in your dwelling place forever. Take me, take me to the place where you are. I just want to be with you. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence, feasting at your table, surrounded by your glory, in your presence, that's where I always want to be, I just want to be. I just want to be with you. Keep on singing it one more time. I just want to be where you 
heart, can't you feel them? In your dwelling place forever. Don't you want to be where he is? Take me to the place where you are. Hallelujah, Jesus. I just want to be with you. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Feasting at your table. Surrounded by your glory. In your presence, that's where I always want to be. I just want to be. I just want to be with you. How you, Jesus? I just want to be. I just want to be with you. Let's just praise God right now. Let's just feel His presence right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord Jesus. Just praise Him right now. Yes, you may not have been in the same situation as my husband has been in, but there's other situations in your life that you know that God has touched you and brought you from a lot of things. Just praise Him for what He has done for you tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we just praise You, Lord Jesus. We just praise You, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Here we are in Your presence. Pray. 